we're looking at the uh, gas power cycles. We looked at the, uh, the auto cycle the other day. Very closely related to the to the uh, diesel. diesel cycle, but but not quite. A little bit different. Uh, if you remember the uh, the auto cycle, By, did you go check your car engine and while it was doing this? Going through and it worked out. It was pretty. Yeah. Responding. Yeah, we pull like we yeah. pull two spark wires off it. As you pull them off, it gets worse. Hmm. We'll have to see if we can, uh, if we can grab them. Though. So the first part of it is an isentropic compression. Not the first part, and then that's where the car engine starts. But we have to start our picture somewhere. So we started with an isentropic compression. Remember, this is uh, this is the 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 piston actually compressing the gas and the fuel mixture, which both ha happens in both the auto and the diesel cycle. Then we model the combustion with a, a, a constant volume heat addition, which for us models the explosion of the gases and the incredible uh, pressure and temperature increase. That great increase in power allows the piston to be driven back down again in an isotropic expansion. This time that's the power stroke and then there's a constant volume heat rejection as we model it. It's not quite what happens but it's darn close enough. And all the regular thermodynamic things apply. Um, for example, the heat transfer is going to be however much uh, mass of air there is in the cylinder times the oops four times the change in the uh, the uh, oh I had it right awesome. three two yeah times the uh, the change the increase in the uh, internal energy. And so we looked at that in some detail. Um, we're going to look more at the diesel cycle today to finish things up. Talk a little bit about the Brayton cycle, just because we did come across it up at the current plant. Um, plus, it's another another type of engine with which you're fairly used to uh, seeing, even though you may not quite know it. In the uh, diesel cycle, we still have a isotropic compression. Again, this is the very same process as in the auto cycle where the gas in the air is compressed to, uh, to enhance the, the combustion. However, the uh, main difference occurs right there where in the diesel fuel air mixture self ignites. There's no spark plug that ignites it and as such it's a constant pressure heat addition at least as we model it. But that's part of the power stroke and then the rest of the power stroke brings it down to here again in an isentropic expansion and then we have the constant volume heat rejection as we model it. And then the cycle continues. So uh, the main difference for us really is in this, this uh, part of the um, um, that part of the work uh, that's done in two to three. something like that, I guess, with capitals. I should have a capital here, capital U. But that work that's being done there is simply P 
PDV work. And then, of course, we recognize U plus PV as the enthalpy. So for modeling that part of the process, we'll use delta H, even though it's a closed system. Whereas for the other ones that we modeled, it was delta U. <coughs> uh, the chain, the, the only other extension we can make to this is for what we call cold standard cycles, which again is a, an assumption that eases the, uh, the a calculation of all of these parts. We can say then that uh, that these are based upon the constant specific heats at an average uh, essentially atmospheric temperature and pressure. Remember that for delta U we use C sub B and for delta H we use C sub P. And sorry, I should put a, a mass in here because I have the capitals. The total heat transfer. Okay, only other thing uh, I guess we need is remember we had a compression ratio defined for the auto cycle. Remember what that was? R. Very good. Very good. Who, who shared that with us? That was, that was superb. R. Very good. Was that you, Paul? Yeah. 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 It doesn't miss much, does it? No. It's, you just gotta shake your head at, at some some kids just have all the academic tools they need. <laughs> all right, Paul. What is R? I don't know. I just said it's the compression ratio. <laughs> <laughs> no way, really. <laughs> take take a wild guess how it's defined. It's, uh, You're not Paul. <laughs> we'll wait. We could be outside, sitting in the sun, but we'll wait. Hey, how is the sun out there, by the way? Beautiful. Yeah. How's that poetry class going? Good. Oh, they're done. They came in. Uh, anyway, we're... <laughs> how do we... Hey, Kim, before you go today, i got to talk to you about something else. Mm -hmm. came but it has nothing to do with Paul. Paul's still on the hook, and you missed it. Do you want to repeat Are you guessing? I looked it up in my notes. Because you couldn't look at the picture and come up with that. Remember, that's the volume at bottom dead center over the volume at top dead center. And of course, it also works for the specific heat ratios because it's a closed system, so the mass was just divided out. We have that same definition over here. We have, again, the compression ratio defined over here in exactly the same way. V1 over V2, the maximum volume divided by the minimum volume. But we also have an intermediate volume, and of course that has a big play uh, in the efficiency and the running of these engines. This is the what's known as the cutoff ratio, and it's V3 over V2. And then we can define the efficiency for the diesel engine. Uh, the general de uh, definition, of course, is what it's always been, W net over QH, the heat that we're paying for, uh, which comes from the fuel. Did you write here? Yeah. See, that's why we can't go outside. There's too much stuff that's distracting out there. 
So I have to stay in here. In fact, pull the shades down. And we'll close the door too. We'll get some work done here. Wait, no. <laughs> See, Bill started to panic. So don't <laughs> <laughs> do that. It was a cool one. All right. When you work through these, and especially when you put in the cold standard uh, assumption for the model, uh, the best way to ever calculate the efficiency is to use the ratio of the work to the heat transfer. But uh, other, perhaps sometimes easier ways to look at it, uh, that all then shakes out using the cold standard assumption uh, to be something like that. But we can also cast this using ideal gas law in the cutoff uh, and compression ratios. And it comes to be 1 over R K minus 1. Paul knows what K is, of course. Does everybody else? Captain Crouch. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's the... R raised to the Captain Crunch minus one. Yeah, see, even Bill thinks that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to the C? So that's that's, that's like, that, that, that must be the knockoff one. <laughs> Trust Bill to one catch that bag. one thing all year. <laughs> like a ziplock. The one lock. thing all year. <laughs> Still pretty good. Times the cutoff ratio to the K power, I mean to the Captain Crunch. <laughs> Those two minus one over K, which we don't know what it means. R C minus one. And for both the auto and the diesel cycles, it's uh, very much the case that the efficiency of either of these engines tends to increase with the uh, compression ratio, which is part of why that's talked about a lot when guys are talking about car engines. Because what else do they have to talk about? Uh, it's also true that the auto efficiency is generally greater than the diesel efficiency, all other things being equal, but it's also true that the cutoff or the compression ratio for auto cycles is a little bit smaller. Uh, part of why they tend to be car engines as well, they're, they're a bit smaller that way. Yep. Isn't the thermal efficiency of turbines greater than both of these? You're going to buy a turbine car? I'm just wondering, why, why aren't we using turbines? Uh, they, they, there used to be, there used to be a, a turbine car raced at Indy 20, 25 years ago, I guess. And, and they, no, it, it, it was a whole turbine engine, but it also was a ground effect car where it would, would create a bit of a vacuum underneath the car, which would increase the normal force which increase the friction, so you get better traction without more weight. Um, uh, maybe Janet Guthrie drove it, the first woman to drive an Indy. I don't remember if she had the turbine car. I don't think so. I think it was just that same time. What, what happened? Um, uh, I'm not real so sure. It could have been mechanically they weren't worth it too much. Power. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe they're too good. You're winning Indy too much. <laughs> If I had to guess based on what I know from what my dad's told me his plan, it's because you don't let your car idle for 30 minutes before you decide to drive. I mean, it takes time to build that steam so that you can go. So that no, and these are not steam turbine cars. <laughs> what kind of turbine cars? No, 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 these, are, these were, these were uh, uh, Brayton cycle cars hmm. that, that we'll look at now, but I don't have any board space. So I have to wait for Paul's permission. You compared the compression no, ratio but, to the thermal efficiency of it. Compared R and N. Yeah, I was kind of oh, too. that's just an R with a, with a lazy R. I got nervous. His hand went up. I said, uh oh. Something, 
Seven. This can't be good. This, this, this can't. Alan's on the on the hunt. All right, we'll come back to diesel cycles to wrap up the term, but we'll look uh, real quick at at, uh, at braking cycles now, which is also the same cycle, not only the cycle used in the topping cycle at uh, Malcolm's dad's plant. And, and it is his plant. I checked ownership and his dad owns it. It's his very own plant. Um, but it's also the jet engine cycle that's used. It's just things are sized a little bit differently, obviously. But the ideas are very much the same. Is there much climb up that tower? What's that? No, I've never been up in the tower. Oh, yeah, except you do it now. What? I do want to find What did Paul say now? We're just talking about Jay Leno's you know, jet engine car. Yeah. He has one? Get some he used a helicopter. Make sure you wave it. So it's I bring it down. 3,000 RPM. Something's going on over there. We have to wait for it, I guess. And I know what it is. Yeah. Alan's not wearing your I was just waking up Fiona. You're not wearing your iPad? No. What? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a hat on my head and stuff. Okay. The Brayton cycle <laughs> is just what. Uh, they've got at the Corinth plant. It's also uh, the very same thing for a jet engine cycle. It's a turbine and a compressor generally joined on the same shaft. No reason they shouldn't be. And fresh air is drawn in to the... Oh, fresh air would be blue, wouldn't it? Fresh air is drawn into the compressor um, if you remember from uh, Mr. Menelaro talking about the gas turbine, he said something about it having to get started. And once he got started, it would run on its own. They have to get it started uh, with an auxiliary motor because it needs to start drawing in this fresh air. That doesn't just happen automatically. You can't just flick a switch and these things start running. It's an auxiliary motor to get it running, to pull in the air, compresses the air, which is then put into a, combu a combustor, which has got to be big enough for the words, wherein fuel is also injected. If I remember, it's a natural gas plant. Yes. Right? So natural gas comes in there, burns in the combustor, heats the gas and the uh, combustion products, that's then run through the turbine, which outputs some net work. The net being, of course, that part of the power is going to the compression of the air in the first place. Our model for the Brayton cycle has the same general mechanics just that instead of modeling combustion, we model it as a, just a straight heat addition. If you happen to take Thermo 2, you will look at the details of combustion in much greater um, fashion than, than we're, we're, in fact, we're not looking at the combustion at all, we're just calling it a heat addition. Then that high pressure high temperature is put into the combustor. Generally, it's simply exhausted from the uh, end of the turbine. Um, most likely, it goes through some particulate and environmental um, processes to clean it up a little bit, but generally, it's just exhausted. However, since that's to atmosphere and the intake is to atmosphere, we'll model that as a closed cycle where we simply have a heat exchanger that takes off the excess heat and then the cycle continues in that way.
the only significant difference between the power cycle that Mr. Manila runs as the top of his cycle, and remember this, this exhaust is still very hot and that's what was used to heat the steam cycle, which is why this was called a topping cycle and his steam cycle was called a bottoming cycle because they're set on top, uh, at least thermally one on top of the other. Um, if you remember though, at one time he even referred to this as being essentially a jet engine, which it is. The big difference between the, the gas turbine that Mr. Manolero was running and a jet engine is that the turbine on a jet engine Brayton cycle, it's almost, almost its entire purpose is to run the compressor. Wherein here, not only does it have to run the compressor, it has to run the electrical generator, which is the whole purpose of these plants. So you'll find that the turbine part of a jet engine is very, very small. Almost that entire jet engine hanging under the wing is compressor. Uh, you'll also see out the front that kind of nozzle thing. Um, that's a diffuser, helps distribute the air as it comes in. Um, but the whole, the main point of the jet engine, well, there's two points to it. One is the compression of the air before it goes into the combustor. But then two, of course, once it comes out of there, it's very greatly expanded. Look at that. And it serves as thrust. Um, tragically, of course, oftentimes, oh, yeah, the geese get stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's, those it's aren't just, geese, those are seagulls. No, those are geese. Those are seagulls. <laughs> geese have a long One, thing. there's no such bird as a seagull. Like those Two, are, those, those are, are geese. <laughs> those are bait. Those are. What's a geese look like? What's a geese? Other than that. <laughs> What's a geese look like? They, well, first of all, they're trying to be formation. Do you know why they're, they, do you want one side? I'm looking longer? at them from the front. Okay. Do you know why one side's always longer than the other in the B? Oh. Is this a goose joke? <laughs> it's a question. Do you know why one side is always longer than the other? Because they're not flying directly into the wind. They're flying a bit into a crosswind. Nope. That's not why. <laughs> well, there's more geese on that side. <laughs> I, I, see now there's, there's, a, there's a perfect example where higher mathematics works even in biology. <laughs> so thank you very much. Alan, um, the Brayton cycle, as if anybody cares anymore, <laughs> on our uh, PV diagrams, looks basically like this. The fundamentals change a little bit for whether it's a gas turbine cycle uh, for power production or for a, a jet engine. But it's got the compression, the isentropic, we model it as isentropic compression at least, in the compressor at the front. Then the combustor we model as a constant pressure heat addition and then through the turbine we look at it as an isentropic expansion through the turbine. That's the main work phase. Um, then uh, in a real cycle those two points are separated because we have intake of fresh air here and exhaust gases there, but we model it as a closed loop as if those were really joined and we, we bring the very same air back. But that's just our model so that we can get to understand these things sufficiently. And the the, we define a uh, pressure ratio rather than a uh, compression ratio since it's not really a piston at all, but uh, 
the, the pressure limits, at least through the compressor, is defined as RP, and then the efficiency comes off of that. That ratio is typically about 1 to 15, and then the efficiency um, looks something like 1 minus 1 over, and nobody's figured out what K is, because Paul kind of screwed all that up for everybody. But there it is again. Specific heat ratio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, do you know if the uh, advanced thermodynamics class, like the next one, would cover things like a non steady state version of a Brayton cycle, like a mm -hmm. startup scenario? Uh, probably, probably not. The, the at least for a power cycle where these things tend to run for thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. Startup is, of course, a bit of a concern, but a, a, such a short, very short period of the course and uh, uh, of, the, of the life of the turbine is mm -hmm. not studied. Probably just in Thermo 2 it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Plus, remember, these get spinning with an auxiliary motor, so it's not really a thermodynamic problem. Okay. Um. I was just curious because I know that for the steam cycle at my dad's plant, they actually have more more care was put into that than anything else besides the turbine was the startup part of it. Well, it's it's going through a lot of uh, thermal changes. You're mm -hmm. going from cold to very very hot components in some places, and you have to do that slowly. As the strength of materials class will know if they haven't already watched the thermal effects video for this morning. What? That was one for today. Yeah, I already took it down. I thought you'd already watched it. That's unfortunate. <laughs> you know, I let you watch it, but it wasn't awesome. <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to put it up, and then I thought, why bother? This I, was, group? I was here for strength this morning, but no one was there. You was here. Were you really? Yeah. Sucker. All right, so we'll wrap up the semester then with a look at diesel, diesel cycles, and then you can go outside and have your lunch on the lawn, where your minds happen to be anyway. I got Cass's going for lunch. Okay. No wonder you sit over here. I don't blame you a bit. Notice that I, I over the term, I've started drifting over here more and more for the the, the work I do too, because I'm getting a little bit far away from that side of the, the room. It's crazy over there. <laughs> All right, here's a diesel cycle for you to analyze, and then I'm done with it. Which is pretty much. I, I, it's a, a, couple hours I have to put up with you for a final, but you generally you're pretty quiet during that. And then graduation, you're way over there and I'm way over there so we don't mix. That's awesome. So, a diesel cycle that runs something like this. The compression ratio, and you can ask Paul what that is if you don't know, is 18. Cutoff ratio is 2. Point one is essentially atmospheric. And I think that's all you need. So find all the temperatures and pressures. You're probably going to have to find at least the temperatures anyway because you need the state points 
to come up with the U's and the H's at the appropriate places. Find the thermal efficiency using our standard definition. And find the mean effective pressure. Remember what that is? Yeah, don't look at don't look to Paul, everybody. Between the same volume limits, there's some pressure such that the area of that simple rectangle is the same as the area of our cycle, which of course is the network. So it just gives us an idea of, uh, of uh, where the engine stands uh, essentially compared to others. So, if anybody, anybody needs thermo tables to do this, because you're going to have to uh, go into those a bit for uh, the heat transfer parts, certainly you need the enthalpy for that one, you need the internal energy for this one, because the upper one also has PV work being done, where the other one has no work being done. And remember that 3 to 4 and 1 to 2 are both isentropic processes which brings into play certain uh, uh, relationships between P and V and T that aren't true during other processes. So anybody need uh, thermo tables? One, two, I think I only have two. So, I don't know what to make a pack of women here. Yeah. 
It's Mr. Thatcher. It's a special. It's a burst. Mr. Thatcher. <laughs> he didn't respond.
two here. I lost my spot. Remember the thermal efficiency using those ratios with R and stuff is the cold standard assumption. You don't need to make that cold standard assumption here other than uh, I think for C sub P and C sub V if you use them. Which I don't think I did because we got the tables. Always use the tables if you can. Then you don't have to make nearly the assumptions you're making in other things. The knuckle are filling in. Processes are all reversible. That's not what I got, Alan. What you two? Was it close to that? Well, oh, kinda. Like you crashed the plane. <laughs> ideal gas law. You just, can't, you, you just can't use this table to find T. You use this to find B. And then you can use your, you know, your, your compression ratios to find the other B's, but you can't, you can't use this to find the time. You can for point two, for point two but not for point three. For B1 in the chart. No, you can only use VR and PR for isotropic. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> 
is the same as the ratio of these slopes pressures, which means I don't even know what find the other I one. Find that. I use the idea of that. Right. So. But I should be able to get it. Oh, I would go ahead and do that. Well, I should be able to get pressure too now. Just in the Introduce. Introduce yourself. The last day of class. Won't kill you. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. About 300. For which one? For P2? No. Because there's an air table. <laughs> <laughs> I just use ideal gas. Bullshit. Oh, <laughs> that just cancels ours. What did you look at to see what the volume The only thing we don't know is P2. This is what it is. Yeah, I've been using only a two thirds of that. I found over here where the volume. I've been using P. We had 34 P5, right? P1 over T. And I just ended up with it. These two ideal gas all work. works. That's the same amount of volume. 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 That's the same amount of Thank you. 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 Um, v1 over V2, which is the compression ratio, is also equal, of course, to the specific volume ratios, because that just means you divide out the math. But since it's isotropic, that's also the reduced volumes, which are in the tables. So you can use this can look that one up, solve for this one, and then look that up. That will give you the temperature. So we're solving for the reduced second. Yes, and, yeah. so and then you go to the table, look it up, and it gives you the temperature. So Did you have to kind of yes. For V2, you do. Well, I don't think you have to, I don't think you have to do it much. Not much. Just a little bit. Yeah, you're only on one. Uh, a twiddle. And RCH we used to say. You know that term, don't you, from the military? RCH? Being really close, you're just off by an RCH. I think that's a sui case. No? Later. For later. In unmixed What's Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, yes. We never said RCH, though. Right. What'd you say? <laughs> the actual <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because you lived and worked in unmixed company. You <laughs> do that nowadays, and you're going before the board on diversity. Um, just a curiosity. Is that the correct for P2? No. No. Okay. You're right, Paul. You have to do that ratio. Use ideal gas law. Uh, well, you can't use it for two things because that's one equation to one number. But you can get the temperature this way, then use that and the ideal gas law to get the pressure of two. What, a two? Uh, from point one, yeah, 50 times bigger. 
I think I'm right. Yeah, the inverse of that. power, right? Because this is the one that was for two. There you go. Three, four, four, five. five. That's the R2. We have this is P1 with the exponent. Multiply by three. Oh, because we're bringing it over to. Uh, no. All right. Three. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna have. We're gonna have. Check my D3. We're going to raise this to the negative zero. Bring in the R2. Right. Right.
P2? Okay, it is. Yeah. That's not an equation. No, equation. I know. That's the thing. No. So literally, it's so going R times P1. I didn't. I'm still not seeing it. Here, I'll maybe I can help with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I might have. You've got everything in there except P2. Right. If you remember that V1 over V2 is R. So, try it again. Do your algebra carefully this time.
for the school. Hey, according to him, from the job man who did for me, there's another just, million. I would just buy you a little bit of pressure ratio from one to two. Is but then what would I do? Bum around the bill for the rest of my life? Yeah. Waste your life. You have no worries or cares. Well, I have one care. I need a ticket for my wife.